This week we have a very special guest joining us, none other than the incredible Levi Roots. Now you may remember Levi from his sensational appearance on the Dragon's Den, where his reggae reggae sources took the world by storm. In our conversation, we delve into the fascinating parallels between our childhoods. Levi's journey from hitting rock bottom in jail to achieving remarkable success and the immense pressure that comes with a business blowing up overnight. Stay tuned for an inspiring and thought-provoking discussion. So, um, Levi, first of all, listen, could I just thank you very, very much for um, agreeing to do this? Because I know you're a man that don't do many of these sort of podcasts. So I feel very honoured that um, you uh, you agreed to do this. So, first of all, I want to thank you for um, for doing this for me because I know you're a busy man. And um, uh, I've been looking forward to doing this sort of podcast because, you know, you and I have known each other a long time. Not only have we known each other for a long time, but we, we are, we're both from Jamaica. And I think it'd be really interesting just to really to try and um, get a glimpse about our sort of experiences. The whole basis of this podcast is called Success is Not Normal. People who go on and achieve great things, they do it because there is something extraordinary about them. And that's what this podcast series is all about. And I want to try and really get people to understand if you want to try and achieve something, it ain't just going to be, it's not just going to happen. You've got to tap into what is extraordinary about yourself. So if we start from the beginning, Levi, so no one um, knows you at all, um, tell me a bit a bit of your backstory. Where, where, where were you born? Clarendon. Clarendon, as 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 us, us Claridonians like to, to call ourselves, is one of the most beautiful parishes of Jamaica, which I'm sure you will play a legacy to that, um, Mr. Wilfred. But um, it's a very sort of sugarcane, sort of flat, lots of waters. Uh, I think the, the, the nickname of Jamaica, which is the land of wood and water, is I, I think is attributed to the way Clarendon is set with lots of sugarcane and plus you need a lot of irrigation and, and every lake has jumping fish, you know, every tree carry fruits. You don't need to pick the fruits off the tree. You can just sort of lay yourself underneath the mango and it's, it's hanging off the tree and, and literally gorge yourself as a young person. So I had the most beautiful... So, 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 which, part of, which part of Clarendon? Because I'm, I'm from Frankfield. I know. Well, yes, yes. I'm from a small, a small place called Content, and but you may know the, the slightly bigger place up top, which is called Yorktown, or, or yes. just down from Maypen, which we like to mm -hmm. say is the capital of of Clarendon. Um, exactly. Yes. So exactly. I, I would say Maypen is perhaps the closest to to Owls Content, which mm -hmm. is a, a tiny village where my my grandfather. Um, was the kind of Superman from 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 the village? A well known person, uh, mm -hmm. my great grandfather, um, um, was there. So yeah, it, it it's a very idyllic small small place in Jamaica. Um, okay, because I know that when I in, in Jamaica and I tell people that I'm from Clarendon, they say, "Oh, you so you're from a bush?" They call it bush. <laughs> Anything that it seems to be country, yeah, they yeah. call it. Yeah, I love that. I I, I used to love the association which. Be, you know, you used to get being a country boy when I first came to this UK because I remember back then, you know, most of the, the first generation um, of, of, of kids that were brought over, if you ask them where they were come from, even if they were down from the deepest part of Buckbush or wherever, and you ask them where you're from, they would say Kingston before you know it. And it became very fashionable for kids to say they're from Kingston. But I remember when I'm coming over, I was very proud of being a Claridonian, you know, and, and I was very proud of being a country boy because I couldn't be anybody else. Um, I wasn't very educated in, in any way at all. As a matter of fact, you know, I couldn't even spell my first name when I first came over to, to the UK. So I struggled a lot in, in that areas. But when you ask me, you know, to cook the food and to tell you about the fruits and how, how to, you know, to, to be a proper country boy at the age of 11, 12, I was mm. the most amazing um, so friend. You so, so you and I then, Levi, were quite proud to be country boys rather than pretending that we were from Kingston. So everybody pretended they were from yeah. Kingston, but in reality, they were country boys or country, country girls. Boy, yeah, we lived it. We owned it. We owned it. We owned being country sort of people. So you were brought up in... In, in, in bush, in, in, in country, 
And um, so th my story is that my father came over here first, then my mother joined him, then I was left to be brought up by, by, by my relatives. How? What? What was your story? It was similar, and I'm sure for a lot of um, kids back then, you know, as as Windrush children, as 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 it were, you know, I, I think we we all you know went through the same thing. Um, for me, I I always tell the story of coming in from out of play, and it was a scenario every year. My grandmother looking after the kids, as it were, again. Um, every year a suitcase would arrive. I would come out from play. I would see my grandma in tears you know, on one hand, and I would look on the other side and I would see this brown suitcase. And and after a few of my brothers left, I slowly began to realize that, you know, maybe one day when I see come from play and see my grandma in tears and see a suitcase, it's going to be my turn as, as the youngest one. Um, and normally the last one to leave because the parents couldn't do with a young child when they had to do two, three jobs at a time. So the young ones always get left until last. And I was put into that position of seeing granny in tears, seeing the suitcase, and knew in that, you know, it was goodbye to one of my brothers and sisters. So it was the very same, I think, for a lot of Caribbean families in those days. So where were you in the family then? Were you one of the youngest, were you? I was the, I was the youngest. I was the youngest. And as I said, then I wasn't the first to come over. Um, because, you know, back then it was the kids that had to come over to go through school very quickly and then to maybe to get a job to help the family, to help that process to, to, to start again as, as these conquerors, as I, as I like to call the Windrush generations were. So mm -hmm. they had a real plan and not just to come over and settle it. For them, it was planned out that the youngest maybe came last and the grandma normally sort of played that part in, in keep the whole process going. But um, yeah, and finally it was my turn to, to come over. To come over. And yeah. how old were you when you came over? I was 11. I, I was 11, as I said, very green. Um, the only thing I knew was just this small place. The only person I really knew was mom and dad and the dog and the cat and everything in one was my grandma. Because my mom at the time when left was about, I was about four years old at the time. So I um, didn't really have that connection with parent or brothers and sisters, um, because they were just leaving. Every year I would come in and the scenario was the same, same. granny in tears, suitcase, goodbye, brother, you know, great life. I thought I was going to be there forever with this amazing woman that was teaching me about food and, and how to cook and how to be a, a young man proper. Mm. I didn't really miss my mom and dad proper. Well, you see, that's exactly the same as, as me, because I came over when I was four, I can remember coming over in the winter, seeing snow for the first time, which was a bit yeah. of a shock. And then these two people, strangers, who are purporting to be my mum and dad, <laughs> and then, you know, having to adjust to it. So when you look back now, you just think, my God, how did we as children really cope with this massive change? I mean, do you remember any of that time when you first came to Britain the first time? Yeah, I mean, it, it was the most difficult thing is is finding a, a kindred spirit, you know, because I'd left mines in my grandma um, behind. Uh, so there wasn't anyone to, to for those moments. For instance, when I discovered um, racism, for instance, for the first time, who, who do you go to? I wasn't prepared for this, you know, where I come from. It was about class, you know, people recognize class. They didn't recognize color, you know. It, it wasn't a thing that we grew up and we were expected that, oh, when we get to England, we're gonna face these people and they're white and they got once on one side they go, they're gonna to want to love you up because you know you'd meet that the the fashion skinheads who love the blacks and want to know everything about the music and Prince Buster and blah blah blah. And, and it was great. But on the other end, you met the fascist guys who wanna rip your head off and no one prepared you for that. And and it was at times when I felt like I wanted my granny when I when I first faced that, coming out from school and facing a, a bunch of guys that was never in my history or never in my thought process that mm. I, I would meet people like, like this. Um, and so, so where, where, did, where did you come to then? Did, did you come to London or, in my yeah. case, my parents went to Birmingham. So where did you um, come to? Well, we came straight, straight to Brixton, straight. My parents was one of them that, came, you know, was came to South London. Um, I came here and I think it was in some ways, it, it was a blessing that I did come. To, we, we lived in Brixton at the time because it was the hub of the Caribbean community. And of course, when that happens, you find that people find themselves very quickly. 
and, and even for myself, I think going to Brixton Market for the first time was one of the ways that actually helped to to, to sort of sort of blend me into the country a, a little bit more than the struggle with the winter and racism and all the kind of stuff that you face as a young boy coming over back then, trying to integrate. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I think the community that Brixton was at the time mm. was was so, one that kind of held you together in, in exactly, some... Exactly, because I think the same thing with mine. So we... We were brought up in Small Heath in Birmingham, and it, it had an Asian community and, and a black community. And then also we had the church. I can remember you know, being brought up with your church. Were, were, were your people church people or, or, or not? Yeah, absolutely. Typical. Um, I think, again, that was the life and soul of what held Caribbean people together. They, they had a purpose to be together because, you know, we know the history of no dogs, no blacks, blah, blah, blah. Um, and and it, this was the reasons why they had to, to bunch together. And I suppose our issue to do with music and art and all that come out of those times. For instance, you know, I'm just talking about sound systems to somebody else the other day. And it, it was because of that binding of people that even sound systems started to create in this country because Caribbean people were, were having competition amongst them each, each other with the radiograms in their house. Mm. And it's from that. that I remember people, that. I remember. The parties and the Shabins came into play and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. So <laughs> I remember that the, sort of the Caribbean community split into two. So there was those that was very religious. Mine was a very, very religious um, background. Like my father was a, a pastor. And we had to go to church every Sunday and even during the week. I hated it because, you know, I wanted to be out doing all the, you know, playing with the sound systems and doing all the Shabin things. But, you know, it was very, very much, you know, you have to become a, a good boy. I had to go to church. So where were you then? So were you were you a church goer or were you a sort of the sound systems boy? Yeah, I, I still I, I I think I I slightly differ with that there, uh, Wilfred, because I I I seem to saw that whoever you were back then, the church was always an intricate part of 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 your life, and I say yeah. that because as a person for myself who grew up through Rastafari even from a very young young age of, of 17, just leaving school, I was singing Bob Marley's song and twisting up my hair and, and was talking to Rasta people and was going a slightly different way. But it, it was still yeah. the order of the church that led me, you know, to, to where I was. So I, I think the community always held together because of that. There was one purpose. If there was yeah. one purpose that we all had at Caribbean people coming coming through and still trying to disperse ourselves in this in this community. But the one thing that kept us together was our religious beliefs and our religious con connection. So I yeah. think it was always there, even in my own life as a Rasta man coming through. OK, so you, you come here at the age of 11. You you living in Brixton, you then go to school locally. What was the educational system like for you? Oh, literally non-existent. I mean, how how could it be? You know, you, you you excel because you're prepared for it. That that's the normal way. We weren't prepared for for it. Um, I wasn't anyway. You know, so I I, I struggled. Um, I rebelled. I, I I didn't know who I was. There wasn't any straightening out for me. Um, as for some kids that had gone through the system through kindergarten and you know primary and come right through. There was none of that for, for children like ourselves, you know, the Windrush kids coming over straight from Jamaica. And as you said in the intro, coming raw from country is even worse for, than even coming from Kingston, where you even get the chance to even speak the Queen's language, you know, which in, in where I was from, in content, in deep Clarendon, the way we spoke back for back then, you know, I don't even want to flash some at you right now, um, I'm Wilfred, because it would bring back your memory. And we don't want to go back that deep. So, mm. so there was no preparation for, you know, for that. So it was obviously looking back now, I see why I struggled um, back then in, in the community. And mm. it didn't take until much later. Um, that I realized that there was some good in me. And, and it was actually looking back at what my grandma used to tell me, that, you know, life is going to be about food. I should see my eyes through recipes and things like that and through food. And, you know, it's about the flavors that you can bring and, mm. and, the, and tap into that, that, that I found success, success in the end.
And that's really interesting because, again, very similar experience. The school, I, they used to call them secondary moderns. I think at my age, you did 11 plus, And if you failed the 11 plus, you then went to secondary modern school. Mm. The school that I went to, it was like, it was seen as a bit of a dustbin. They didn't expect much from the kids that went to that school. So I left school without any qualifications. I could hardly sort of read and write. And then also being treated like you're a bit of a failure. So um, I, I left school without any qualifications at all. And like yourself, not really understanding what's going on. So you then so when did you leave school? And then what did you do after you left school? I left, I left school at 16. I left school at 16, then went straight into a Majesty's displeasure <laughs> um, <laughs> at detention. I had my first detention because, as I said, it's, it's always a, a spiral down, isn't it? I, I mean, nowadays I go back into these communities and I, and I see these kids and I see the same thing happening now when we're talking about knife and gun crime and all that kind of stuff like that. I, I see the visions of how it, it happened to me. You know, that you're not prepared for these things that we call education and then move on and do good, get your job and so on. That has to be from at the root. Um, and, and you know, for me, it was never there. So, as you say, leaving school was straight as, as it was back then at Her Majesty's pleasure into jail to learn the tough way and, and to realize yourself from then. So what, were they called Brussels then in those days, were they? Yeah, well, mine was DC, detention centre. Yeah. yeah, detention centre. Yeah. So you went to a... De and how long did you have to go for a detention centre for? Three months. It, it, was a, it was a hard slap on the wrist back then. It, it was a wake-up call um, for, for young people. And but, so, but... so how did you remember it then? Was it... I mean, if you're talking about going into alien environments, coming to this country is an alien environment, going to school and then going to a detention centre, what was that like? You came out worse. And, you know, I, I'm saying it now, and, and people that know the system will understand that that is the case for a lot of kids here right now. You meet worse criminals, you know. You educate yourself more in criminality, in, in that kind of thing. And you come out, instead of being a better person, you come out being a worse person. Um, it, it's clear, you know, you know, th th these are the hidden facts um, for young people that is only when you go through the system and manage to, to drag yourself out of it, you look back and, and, and you realize, you know, that, that this is what it was. Um, and for me, there's been many a look backs. But now, you know, Wilfred, I, I, I treat those mistakes as feedback, as you know, I've often said, you know, I see none of that as, you know, as, as something, as mistakes, you know, mm. I see it as a way for me now to plot, you know, as, as it were back then when I did, you know, came out of all that, managed to drag myself out of it. Okay. I, so I, one, of the, one of the questions I want to ask Levi is this, is that when you look back at that period in your life, is there something that could have happened during your education that could have prevented that sort of thing happening? Or do you think that it was always going to happen? I think what you see is what you get, is, is that old saying, you can mix it up in where, where you want. If you see success, you get success. I, I, would, I would never see someone looking like a, a Peter Jones, you know, or anybody of the people them now who inspires me because they've helped me along in my journey, or I've read their books and it's inspired me in a certain way, or I've seen the films, or, or whatever it, it is. None of these people would come around to where I was back then when I was struggling. It wasn't that I was a bad lad, because again, I hasten to say here, Wilfred, that Dragons then didn't turn me into an entrepreneur overnight. I was always me. <laughs> you know, I'm, I became a multi-million pound seller in Sainsbury's overnight and being able to run the business. So it's obviously, as I was saying, that all you need is for people looking like yourselves to be able to identify with you so you can actually take in the inspiration that you're getting. But none of that happened in, 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 the, in, those, in those days. It does now. You know, there, there's a lot of inspiration going around now to help young people. But back then in the days of the riots and the days of the sus laws and when Brixton was an absolutely no-go area, that's where I was. <laughs> you know, Peter Jones is not coming around there. Mm, so people like you and I really have a big responsibility to communicate to 
people from our backgrounds what is possible. Absolutely, because it, it has to be seen to believe. These young people need to see it. I go into the prisons now, you know, and, and you know, I'm, I'm always so surprised when I see, you know, young people now still think of me and when my thing was so, I'm so old now that I could be their grandfather. But I think the key for them when I go into the prisons and they listen to me and they come out in their droves out of their cell to, to hear Levi Roots is because they identify with who I am. And I think that's important for them, that it's not some guy in a fancy suit who's, who, who's done well, you know, don't get me wrong, and he's come to tell him their story, but he doesn't look like them. You know, he doesn't understand the reasons why they've got there. And, and that's why it's important for us as people, especially as people that looks like these kids, to be able to go and see them, not to send a message or, you know, a video or watch you, but take time out to actually mm -hmm. go and try and inspire. Really, it sounds as though you're a vehicle of hope because, you know, when you look at your backstory, coming from Jamaica, struggling at school, ending up um, having to spend some time in a detention centre, being successful, that must be a massive inspiration for people. Yeah, I, I've, I've always said the only thing I have, you know, to, to add to this world here that's seeking inspiration and seeking help in trying mm -hmm. to find a path in their lives the only thing I have is my story, you know, because sometimes that's all it takes um, is for you to do something to wake up that initiative of, of someone else. It doesn't take you to give money or to, you know, to do any great works or perform any great feats. You know, it is for you to have an inspirational story to tell. Um, I never used to listen when I was a, a young kid because nobody ever told me an inspirational story. It was when I met my first mentor. Who, who sat me down and, and told me not one story, but many stories for me to be able to, to have the time to, to make that change. Um, and that was the most valuable thing, things is, is, is the lessons that I learned from the story that they told. And so let me go a bit further back then. So you spend the time and, um, in detention center, you come back. When did you go back to Jamaica to see your grandmother? And that's a, that's a sad indictment of what you know, the system, you know, is, is done. Because I, I never got to see my grandmother again. Um, my grandmother died when I was still in school, just before I left school. Um, so at the time, it, it, as, as a family and the way we were and the way we lived, you know, it wasn't about traveling back and forth from Jamaica after you've come here. And I still think that's happened to a lot of families who was their plan was never to come over here and settle forever. Um, my parents never got the chance to go back to even see my grandma um, because of the system and the way it works. And now they had to continually working for the system. Now we know it's working for nothing really because you can't forget uh, national health if you, and if you're Windrush generation and all these things. But you know, for them, it, it, it was about, about work. So none of us got to get to see my grandmother again because of mm -hmm. that continuation having to just think you're here in the UK you can't even go back if anything you have your mindset is here and and you're open for better for the future and we all mm -hmm. know what happens in, in what happened in, in the future for, for Windrush generation but mm -hmm. no it, it we didn't get to see her at all again but but as mm -hmm. you know her, her life and her story has become as part of my story um, as anything else you see, I think it is a bit sad because I remember being able to go back and seeing Miss Edna, who is the one that brought me up. And um, it was something that completed the circle for me to be able to actually go and spend time with the woman who, in a sense, sacrificed her life to bring me up. So, you know, it's a bit sad because obviously your grandmother played a massive, it was a massive influence over your life. But um, she died when, how old were you? Do you remember how old you were when she died? I was 16, uh, just before I'd left school. Um, by then, you know, um, her memory had controlled my life. As I said, I, I struggled enormously. The relationship between my father and, and I was literally non-existent. At the time, the way I see it now, when a, a boy child needs that, that kind of connection. Um, and yeah, it, yeah yeah it is sad anyhow so um you're saying about your relate because this is what's really interesting is that um i didn't have a very good relationship with my father as well actually 
And I think that that generation, there would have been, because there was a disconnect at some stage as they're being brought up, there was a disconnect because the parents came over to, to this country. And therefore, when we then came to join them, we came to join strangers. And, and in some cases, that, that connection never really um, came back together again. What, what's your thoughts about that? It was it, it was the beginning of the breakup of the black families, wasn't it? It, it, it was again, I, I say the system, but I, I don't know if it's what else to to call what was happening. Um, you know, from the get go uh, with the with the black black families that that were were, were coming over. You know, I, I I think a lot of that was happening. It, it was the breaking up. It was the discovery um, of this great discovery, but it didn't really had much. Um, it didn't really give back people or gave them an opportunity to seal the family even more. Um, and, and you find a lot of discourse happen. And, and you mentioned about your father and it, it seems it's a, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a, it's a thread through black families about the fathers and the way that the fathers deal with, you know, the household, um, and and I think that had a lot to do with the pressure of our, what the men had um, over here as well too, um, to, to 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 maybe not to have dealt with the, that unity of the family in the way that they should, um, you know. And I speak candidly from my own observation of my own family, and I and you know I don't have you know much love for my own father. I think it's chronic, and I've said that many many times. But but I do understand the pressure, you know, of of these people that they had as i said my father was working three four jobs you know and so was my mom you know my mom worked in king's college hospital she works on the london transport buses and she did other cleaning jobs as well too um mm -hmm. you know three that's then that's just my mom you know I, I knew my dad worked for the council and he did other jobs as well too and this was all to sustain the, the family back then because their dreams were big we had a house you know we, we, you know, Caribbean people back then, you know, you know, after they were living in that first couple of rooms, they moved up quickly and were buying houses. You know, mm. my family was was the was the same as any other white family. Had yeah. they, you know, the house. Well, well, one one of the things I wanted to touch on, really, and you made a really interesting point here, Levi. It's a bit like the breaking up of, of the black families because I think I can remember my own father. He he died. Um, he died some twenty years ago, <clears throat> and for him. Coming to this country was um, was not a good experience. And then, so back in Jamaica, he would have been, because he would have been a preacher man, he would have had some sort of status. Then arriving into this country, when you're having to deal with all the racism, all the prejudice, and then just to find out that all your hopes and dreams are sort of just being disappeared, then there's that feeling of actually, did you make the right sort of um, decision? And then it was then left to the women who then had to then, you know, bring up the children. And um, it then really did cause um, a bit of a shift. And I'm hoping that the third and the fourth generations are helping to sort of repair the, um, the, 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 that sort of um, pain that, that, that people from our generation went through. Have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And which is what I, you know, I, I was sort of trying to explain about, you know, my own experiences with my family and the way that he was and how, you know, this burden, uh, you know, was on them and about preparation also, that people wasn't prepared for, for what was, what was to be there ahead of them. And again, about that breaking up of the, the black families of coming over where you think it's, it's a moment of, you know, of should be of, of unity. But actually, you know, because of forces, it it's actually was a, 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 a taken apart of them. So no, um, you're absolutely right. It was the beginning of that. I did that. Okay, and then so in terms of um, so you, you're on your own to a certain extent. So your 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 grandmother has died. You you have a fractious relationship with your sort of um, family, and then you've got to try and find a way. So what? what just give me um, a bit of your your history then from. Um, from the age of 16 after your time in detention? It was music that, you know, after then. Yeah, I, I left school. I, 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 I remember walking down the street of Brixton one day to go and sign on, um, as you did back then on a Thursday. It was at the employment centre to, to collect. I think it was my like 12 pounds or something like that you got back, back then every other week. 
um, and uh, walking along whistling a tune and um, I saw the great Lloyd Coxon and his sound system with Selector Festus and a few other great legends from, from sound system days trying to put a speaker box into into back of a truck. You know, they were going to play on a dance that night. And me and a couple of friends of ours was going along to side on and they said, hey, kids, come over here and help us to get these speaker boxes in the, in the back of this truck. And we looked over and we, and we was like, wow, is that Festus and Lloyd? And, you know, they were obviously were our heroes back. The sound system was massive. It, it was the way that we got our culture and our messages from Jamaica as young kids that had missed Jamaica. Music was the only way that we could get that message. And Sir Cox and Outer National was the top sound system at the time. So there they were asking us to help them. And of course, we forgot about the signing on and everything and help put the back of the truck in the box. They asked us to jump in the back of the truck to go to the dance in Birmingham. And we jumped straight in there. And Wilfred, I, I always said that I think I've remained in the back of that Sir Coxon truck for the next 50 years. <laughs> Dropping in the back because it was such an inspirational thing for me. Music, joining the sound system, recording my first song, Poor Man's Story. Um, you know, produced by Lordy Coxon, of course, um, who saw my talent and decided that he wanted to record me and to help me to become a, a, a musician. Changed my name, well, not literally, but gave myself the name Levi Roots, um, discovering that 90% of, of us had Scottish name and didn't feel like I wanted to, I didn't think I looked Scottish. So I wanted to change my name and, and be who I felt um, to, to be able to take my musical journey. So what? So what was so? Um, so Levi Rich was your stage name. So what was your? Yeah. What was the name you were born with then? I was born with Keith Valentine Graham, and again showed you how these fathers bloody stayed those days. You know, <laughs> but, uh, we were all given these kind of grandeur names, Keith Valentine. And when I looked it up in school, I, I looked it up and I saw Keith. Keith Graham is Scottish, is, 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 is a clan, a very famous clan that supported the King Batman, very bloodthirsty. Um, we have these names. And I got to find out that 90% of us Jamaicans have Scottish names. Exactly. And I, and I thought, and I thought to myself, I bet you ask if you go along and you find a Scottish man that name, a Bubuka. I, I, <laughs> I have to name um, any one of these Africans real chillish that you have press find one, but you step yeah. black man and you've asked find not to find one with a Scottish name. But and you know what happened is, it, is that in those days, back, back, um, back in time, a lot of the Scottish people joined the military, they settled in Jamaica and yeah. they thought, we ain't going to go back to no cold um, um, Scotland, we're going to come back here. They then obviously well, then <laughs> stayed with, I, with the locals. I figured this down, Wilfred. Yeah. I went on a trip. I went on a trip to find my Scottish inheritance, just to see if anything did leave for me. Yeah. <laughs> it was right. of a TV show that I did, and we went and found my tartan and everything. I still didn't feel very Scottish, but yeah, but that, you know. That's well, a... you see, I've done exactly the same thing, and I've even made my own Scar um, Scottish um, um, tan. So I just think the Scottish uh, are missing out on a big trick because yeah. there's a big, big link between the Scottish and the um, yeah, and Jamaicans, definitely. Absolutely. And if you're and you're right that Jamaica, so that you would either call Winston. So I've yeah. got a brother called Winston after Winston Churchill, yeah. Wilfred, another grandiose sort of English yeah. sort of name. Yeah. So. But we Jamaicans loved Britain so much that they named their children with such grandiose names. I know. And then Keith Valentine. I thought, what the hell was he thinking of? I, I couldn't, that couldn't be on a stage for me introducing Keith. Absolutely no way. And I love all Keith, by the way. And any Keith listening to the podcast, I love you guys. But yeah. not for me. So, yeah, I, I took Levi from the Rastafari calendar. Mm -hmm. which puts the month of June as the third month, the month of Levi. So it starts in April with Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and then July, which is this month, is Judah. Um, Judah. So I, 
suppose Levi as my as my month. So Levi, it's a fantastic. And then the roots, where do the roots bit come roots, from? Again, because I, I was a DJ at the time. I wasn't singing, I was spitting a lot of lyrics. I had this thing about lyrics. And you in those days when you are a DJ, as we used to call it, you needed to have a really strong name. So I just thought to myself, well, if I'm Levi, the roots of Levi, then nothing can stronger than the roots. So I, I just put that together and thought that in that's what I want on my first record and we yeah. recorded it and put it on the Levi Roots Poor Man Story and it was an amazing hit. Yeah, you see that is really good. So your creativity is sh shining. A, to come up with the name, then to be in the music industry. And what's, what I find quite interesting, because I remember back then, as a black person, it was really difficult to get into clubs. You know, if you're black, you weren't, you weren't let in. And so you could then understand why then actually black people then had their own parties, they'd have yeah. their own dances because you just weren't allowed, you know, it was, if you were black, you just would not be let in. The, the amount of times I was humiliated trying to get into a club and being, you know, said you can't come in and it was because of the color of your skin. And I suppose that's where all the sort of sound systems then really started to, to then make their own parties basically. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, and I think this, you, you've got to give the sound system props for, for, for being that uniter between, you know, the, 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 the two sets of people as well. Because when punk came on the scene, you know, with young British kids that were seeking a different direction and wanted a connection with something else, it, it, was, it was reggae and ska was the chosen way for them to make that connection, to, to form an identity. And of course, remember Bob Marley came with Punky Reggae Party and it was a slightly signature for us to come together as, as, as two people. So with Sound System has actually helped to, to make that merger between British white kids culture and mm. these new generations of black culture that was, was coming through um, in the 70s and, and, and 80s. Okay, so you, you, you find the thing that you love, which is music, you're making records, you've got the Levi roots. Tell me more, how do you go from that to eventually um launching a, a range of sources or getting on you know slaying the dragon as you call it well you know wilfred you go down again you know um and that's normal the normal journey um of anyone who has usurped and managed to hang on to it you know the story is never one as how you probably would have thought i was going to say it just went up and up and it's dragon slaying all the way no, it, it went down again. Because again, where you live and where you are determines that you don't make that usurpness so fast that, at all. You know, you, you're remembered for where you are. You have to jump outside of that. And of course, I wasn't able to do that. So again, I got in trouble again. Um, and it was now, that was my final frontier. Um, when I got into that trouble, because you spiral down until when you hit rock bottom, you know, and, and I hit rock bottom in 1986. Um, I was, I was in my 20s. Um, my musical career had just about to take off. I was with a band called Matic 16. We had recorded a song called Jehovah, and it was picked up by a sound system called Jashaka. And and Jashaka is one of the most legendary sound system. That if he plays one of your songs back then, then you, you're gone. You have absolutely made it. Jashaka made Jehovah one of his songs that he plays all the time. And I got in trouble just then, as the band was just about as about to take off. I was given nine years in prison. Nobody thought I would ever come back from that. It was my time. To, 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 to find the best of me. If there was any part of me that I'd made that promise, you know, before and all that, it, it was the time for me to find it. But I couldn't find it on my own because remember what I said, kids nowadays need a mentor, somebody who they can identify with to be able to make that change. I was lucky. I, 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 that person found me, you know, while I was serving my sentence. And you have to be able to listen to somebody like that who's going to change your life. If you're not going to open up yourself and listen up completely, then, you know, it's going to go to one, come to the other. I had the time to be able to make mistakes and stop listening and then go back and then finally thinking, yes, this is... Well, tell, this person seems to be really important to brought about the change. Tell me about this person 
And how did that person manage to get through to you? I'd gone through my, my sentence and I had two years left. Um, I'd formed a band while I was in, while I was in serving my sentence in there and became very well known within the prison system. Um, uh, there was a lady that came in. She was a teacher. She comes in once a week to sort of help prisoners to get themselves ready for when they when they get get out the street. Her name was Teresa, and she was the person who decided to help me to change myself and gave me the right books to read and sort of led me within the right path of how you should be as a person. That's preparation, as a as we talked about at the outset. If you're not prepared for something then there's no way your vision can't be clear for when you go, even though you may have the will. Like, I've, like I said, I've always had the will, and I've said it before, you're not turned into an entrepreneur overnight. You're always you in some way, but you sometimes need somebody just to come along to help you, to, to point you in the right direction, to maybe to, to, to give you the right tools to be able for you to use your own strength. And, and this person gave me that belief in my own skills, in, in my own self. And, and it was through listening to somebody in that mentorship type of way um, to be able to read the right books and, and, you know, and speak the right way when it's necessary and, and to be you when it's necessary also, but also be able to be anybody at any time because you may meet anybody at any time. You will be able to have, can have a conversation in that room, wherever you are. So it, it was these kind of teachings and being able to listen to that person because I had the time and make the plan that this was the new me when I come out. You know, this is not going to be the same person that got that got me in that path in the, in the same day. It, it's, it's a rebirth. It's, you know, it's a metamorphosis. It's, it's, it's the same you as the butterfly is the same caterpillar. The same ugly caterpillar morphs into something beautiful. I don't think I've ever changed from the Levi Roots who is on the street that people knew before. But it's it's the learned me, you know, because you, you have to learn in, in certain way to become you. And to be able to use what, 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 There's a it's interesting. What was it about Teresa that was um enabled her to get through to you? I don't know. And I think sometimes it's that's what mentors do. I, I think to be able to trust someone, especially for people like myself and kids where I'm, where I was from, it's very difficult to trust somebody. To, even if you go and you lay on a couch and you know you're paying somebody thousands of dollars to you know to be your psycho or whatever it is. If you are a rude boy from the street, you're not talk nothing. Make them say, you're not saying nothing at all. You will mm. tell you'll tell them everything that they you, they think they're hearing. But you're not going to tell them everything. And then you're going to get up and nothing is going to be solved. Because mm. if you're not saying everything, then there is no point laying in the couch in the first place. Yeah. So, but, if you, if they, so they don't touch your soul. Yeah. Does, does Teresa yeah. know the, the yeah. impact she's, she's had on you? Yeah, she, she does. And it's a beautiful story because I, I'm, I'm having the Levi Roots movie um, going into production very soon. And we were on a search for Teresa because this was nearly 40 years ago, you know, 35 years ago or so. Um, and we've never spoken because when, when I left, you know, incarceration at the time, you're not allowed to contact back anybody of any sort. But um, we were planning the movie, the Levi Roots movie, and I was on a radio show, the BBC radio show, um, one of these sort of reading shows, you know, very remote Radio 2 show. And um, someone heard me speaking about Teresa and about the, the same thing. And they knew of her because she was from New Zealand and she had gone back to New Zealand many years after, maybe in the 90s, a few years after I, I, I got released. And um, she never came back. But this person heard me, to, just like we're talking about now, talking about this amazing woman who helped to change my life and gave me Shakespeare to read and the, gave me the full book of Shakespeare and says, Levi, read that. And I came back to her in a few months' time, and I could quote Shakespeare from here from now till the morning. It's things like that she 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 would do to me. And yeah, this person gave us the contact, rang the BBC, and gave us Teresa's contact. And I sent Teresa an email, and then I spoke to her on the phone, and I told her that her her role um, in the movie um, that we are planning at the moment is going to be played by. I can't say at the moment because it's zipped. In the next couple of weeks, I'll be able to say who is going to play Teresa. But he's a big star, um, one of our biggest female stars. 
we UK females that we we've, we've got planned um to to play Teresa. So yeah, so that's about her. So it's 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 a it's a wonderful story, and I'm so so lucky and happy that you know I can help now to bring this vision, something that I've kept for a long time. Um, but now I know how important it is for young people to have mentors. And I have this one to show young people that says you can have belief in somebody and they can change your lives. And you see, and it's really interesting that you said that because I've got a name of a person, his name is Jock Gallagher. Again, somebody who went out of their way to give me the time and intention in order to change my life. And I think what we're both saying is the power of good people to have an influence and to make to make changes. And so I think we've both got fantastic um, stories of people who have really done right by us. So, because I want to talk about the movie in a, in, in a moment. So you, you then decide to change after being incarcerated for nine years in sort of prison. Then what happens? Out of, out of that nine, I actually serve almost five. I'm out of the nine. I, I came out as the new me. I wanted to conquer the world. It was a shock when I didn't recognize my local Southwest London, Brixton, you know, as it was back then. Brixton had changed. Um, when I went away, people were smoking spliffs, you know, ganja in, in, in uh, marijuana outside, you know, Brixton and doing this stuff and fine, you know, everything's great. When I came out five years later, people were on crack and it was worse. It looked absolutely terrible. I I struggled to fit into that scenery um, because that one, if you don't know it, you can't just go into it, you know, no matter who you are, where you are, no one remembers you. No matter, you could be Levi Roots from Sir Cox and Sound who used to be a Don walking around, you know, the area. When I came out, I, nobody knew who I was. I, I was not, Brixton had completely changed. Um, it was a few years after that, when, when I just about started to thinking about maybe to delve back into it when the temptation is begin to, to, to draw you. Uh, my mom said to me, said, go down the road and see the man. And I'm, you know, I'm saying to my mom, what do you mean go down and see the man? Which man you talk about? She said, go see the man. The man is the man I talked down the road. I didn't know that Mandela and Prince Charles was visiting Brixton at the time. And she says, yeah, go, go, do, and Mandela is down the road, go and see Mandela. So I came out of my mom's house and I joined the throng on Acre Lane, which is like thousands of people just walking down Acre Lane, going towards the Brixton Recreation Center to see Mandela, who had, you know, just come out of prison a few years before that with Prince Charles in Brixton, thousands of people. And I joined the march on the way down just from my mother's house, about 200 yards down to the town hall. Um, and when we got down to the end there, one of the security guards spotted me in the crowd um, as I was just by where Mandela was about to come down the steps with Prince Charles. And they were looking for somebody to sing happy birthday, Mr. President, to Mandela. And the security guard pointed at me and said, see Levi Roots, they bring him up on stage, Brixton singer. <laughs> and... I was hauled up on stage. And I, I tell you, Wilfred, I didn't even really realize what was happening at the time. I was in a daze from telling my mom that I was just about to, to get back into the gang and do all kind of things. She told me, go and see the man. And I got up on the stage and, and they thrust the birthday cake into my hand. And I'm still like stunned that I, I'm pushed up. And as I remember now Mandela is coming down the escalator in the Brixton wreck and Prince Charles is standing behind him. And he's coming down very slowly, what seems like forever, because I'm standing there trembling and my hand is sweating, thinking that all the chocolate cake and everything is sweating underneath my palms. The greatest man in the world is coming down, what seems like he's floating down the, the, the stairs at me. And as Mandela floated down to the step and I had the case, I, I, I mumbled, <laughs> kind of mumbled and sang, happy birthday, Mr. President. And just think it matter, don't mess it up, Levi. Just say the words. And I said it. And a few minutes after that, I knew what my destiny was. When Mandela took the cake and shook my hand, it was that moment for me to, to, to put together what Teresa had created, 
a few years be before in prison and now i was out the connection was here that i knew that I, I i was this new man and i had to find my path and it was through the food i decided not to be the music man before not to hope to get the big hit as i used to before now i'm going to merge my grandmother's cooking ability you know and and come with you know this sauce that i've been doing at the carnival for a few years and cooking and doing all type of thing and people say yeah they love what they saw and they love what they did and i thought now i'm gonna put this together and make that be my business and i never looked back wilfred i was spotted yeah. by one of the producers of bbc and the rest is history you see and this is what's really interesting because yours is a story of, of redemption and it goes to show that you've always got to have faith that people do have the capacity to, to, to turn turn around. And um, there's also, um, a, there is an ambition in you to always wanting to, 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 to improve, to be better. Because you've got to give yourself some credit because actually it didn't well, just- did What credit? Did you see me at Dragons then? <laughs> Credit for that. I was yeah. sweating like a pig with yeah. come on. I got all my numbers wrong. Everything was absolute. I probably was one of the worst persons that's ever been on Dragon's Den. I gotta tell you that. But you know, the key thing was I was myself. And I think that was the message of Teresa. She was always drumming to me. Be yourself, be who you are. Don't undermine who you are by comparing yourself with someone else. Because it's because we are all different. If we're going to class ourselves to be special, and I class myself to be special, then I have to be an individual. I'm not like anybody else. And, and I think when you can suck onto that and understand what, what that means, whatever frailties you have, you know, I had frailties with numbers, I have frailties with everything, the mathematics, all kind of ticks had <laughs> coming all, all, all over me. <laughs> but I knew what I was good at. And I played that role, and I think that's what people invested in when they saw me under them. But one of the things I think is interesting, though, is that a lot it, it takes courage to put yourself in the in the um, the lion's den. A lot of people may have had the opportunity, but their fears would have stopped them from taking that sort of leap. So when you got spotted by the producer, you know, tell me about that from being spotted to then going in front of the camera. How did you? get the courage to do that don't see well if everybody has ever get into this position don't seek advice <laughs> because people will always try to give you their advice and what they would do it, it's rare when you meet somebody that that tells you to do what you would do to encourage you to do what you do to if anything try to to, to, to to chisel it and to own it to make it even better for you but not to change you. Nobody would accept me doing the song, playing the guitar on, on the show because they'd all seen Dragon's Den before. I was the only fool that had never seen the show. For some reason, I'd missed the show completely when I never saw it at all. So when I started to tell friends that I'm going to be on there and they were like, you know, Levi, you know, you, you can't be you, man. You've got to pretend that, you know, you just pretend, just just wing it, but don't go with no bloody guitar and singing no Reggie, Reggie saw song. The, the dragons, they said the dragons can't even pronounce reggae at the time. <laughs> they be saying Reggie, Reggie saw, all, all things I was having. To, 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 to discourage me from being me, you know, they told me that, I shouldn't call it reggae reggae sauce because it sounded too black, it's too Jamaican, and it's too Rasta. And I said, hey, gonna mean here, that's me. I'm Jamaican, I'm black, and I'm a Rasta. This has got to be about me. It's not about the sauce that's in the bottle. I want them to invest in Levi Roots, and that will help me to bring whatever I have in my trail to come with um as well too not not just just the sauce so i kept the name with the colors of rastafari green gold and red which everybody and you know how our people are sometimes um wilfred sometimes we tend to think that we want to hide our culture behind whereas when we look at other races they put theirs up front bang and i think i wanted to put my jamaicanism and my rastafari right up front because i know what mainstream people thinks about about that they love the color they love the flavor so if you give it to them in the right way they will accept it so i i i, I kept my own vision and i went with the guitar 
and you know what happened next. Yeah, and I think what you've actually said is that the only thing of value is yourself, and it's to have the confidence to sell yourself rather than try to be something that you're not. It's the biggest mistake that most people make, actually. So I, 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 I would totally, totally agree with you. So, so it, it's worth a pause here because here you are, a boy that's just been on this extraordinary journey, and then you get this phenomenal opportunity. How, how in God's name did you feel when you got investment? God, I, you, you know that there's a statue showing Samson with a rail on his shoulder, but he's like in a, in a proper pose, like, you know, like a, a, a hatless pose like that. That's why I feel like holding the rail up on my shoulder. But that rail is largely full of black and Caribbean and Asian people holding up the pressure, you know, of it because literally this wasn't ordinary for these kind of people i mean great the sauce was selling mainstream and it was brilliant that you know i was getting love from everywhere whatever color you are and stuff but when you ask about how did i feel and the pressure that was coming through it was from the community that felt that this was for them and i i couldn't let go of myself because of the community own levi in that kind of way and you you can't slip I couldn't have the hot glass of wine somewhere just in case, you know, I made that odd slip, as we all do. Um, you know, that odd slip sometimes, you know, you have one too much and somebody snaps a picture or you do something quite silly. The the community I know um will not accept that that kind of situation too lightly. Um, so I, I kind of got the fact that now that here was a different responsibility than I had for for everything else, for but for the community that was seeing this as a success. I didn't kick a ball. I couldn't run fast. So, you know, for me, I was about business and enterprise, which reason wasn't really up there um, to the kind of publicity that I was getting at the time. Because you, you turn your TV on, you know, boom, in, in those days and... You know, it's me jumping up with a guitar, singing reggae, reggae, sa song. So it, it it was a lot of publicity at the time. And and for them, they never want to see this, you know, this drop or this fail or anything. Any news that come around by Levi Roots, it better have been positive. You know, that was the kind of situation. So it was a heavy burden to bear in, in, that, in that kind of way. But one that I relished because I relished the love that I get from the community. I know that... I, I can't walk down the street in, in my community and people don't recognize who I am. No way. You know, absolutely. They they know who I am. And for that, I, I've got to be grateful because I work hard for that to be recognized as the brand. It's a massive responsibility because within that, you uh, you give hope. You inspire others about, A, that they could also make it. And they can make it being themselves. And um, I could remember, well, even to this day, you know, I've been to events where you're at and you're swamped because you are still uh, an inspiration. And I think what I've also found is that you're not just an inspiration for the black community. You know, when um, I was telling people about doing this podcast with you, you know, both black and white were really excited. So you managed to actually also extend into the mainstream where you represent um, a lot to young people, especially. Do you feel that? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't feel it any different because the, the, you know, the vibe is is still it's it's still the same. But I, I started out having to to find myself in that community, and I think that is the difference. Is is knowing it's a special part of my journey because, as I was saying about early, sometimes you have to get knocked down to bring yourself up. Because when I did first try to sell the sauce in my local community, I remember we spending thousands on the first batch of bottles after that first carnival when we, when we launched the sauce. And we thought, great, we have got a great community. I live in Brixton, Caribbean community. Every, every bottle is going to sell. I'm going to take it to every black market that there is, you know, Caribbean market. And it's going to be amazing. And I tell you, Wilfred, it absolutely bombed. Nobody brought it. No, them said to me, Levi, we are tell we are tell you about your sell some sauce for why you must sell me some music. We love you for your music. Don't sell me a sauce. It was like this kind of, this kind of thing. Yeah. They never brought it, and we lost a, a lot of money. But I, I never gave up. We decided to go into the shires. 
we made a decision that if it never had Shire at the end of the word of the place, then we're not going to go there. I'm going to go to all the lovely farmers markets, you know, and the lovely countryside markets in the Shires and go with my guitar and bring Caribbean flavors and these stories of my grandma that I play on my music and that represents my food and the way that I cook. And that way I'm going to try sell the sauce. And we did that for a couple of years. I would never sold it in locally at all. Every weekend, I would be out with my team. I would see you sometimes when I would be out there with, with my friends in the Shires doing these farmers markets and and doing and it was it was while I was doing them that the producer from the BBC um, came in into one of my events that I was at and gave me a business card for for my journey to begin begin then. So you, the, the lesson there is that you have to find your own market. You know, nobody has a right to a market. But mm. it took me a mistake of losing out in that first batch of sources that I invested in that said that you don't think that because you're a Caribbean person that you can make Caribbean sauce and Caribbean people make it. Maybe mm. you need to take the story elsewhere. And it was in the Shires that I really found myself. So to answer yourself about the, the you know, about the two communities there, you know, that's a beautiful mm. part of the reggae reggae story that I can tell about how it, it started mainstream, really, mm. first. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's, a, it's a similar story to the Black Farmer brand. The Black Farmer brand is actually what by mainstream Britain. Absolutely. And um, it's inter and you've got to go around. And what I found is that if they like your products, they become great advocates um, and that they help to get the products in, into the supermarket. So it's a similar story that, that that we have. Anyhow, you get the massive success, you know, the, the, the Levi Roots as a brand name. I mean, it must be worth millions now because um, it's sort of known, not just in this country, but it's sort of also known over the world. So what has the journey been like um, since um, the, the, the success of Dragons then? I think it's about Caribbean food. The journey is 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 me trying to bring this fantastic flavor um, everywhere. You know, writing my books. Um, I try to get a book in. You know, every couple of years, um, just to try to bring these flavors to the masses. And uh, I think my products, you know, will continue to be there um, as long as I remain myself. So I don't really concentrate on that. My work is more of a wider work, and now I I put my my resources and my own self into other things, um, doing you know for the community and and just for my own personal well being. Um, and do, that, 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 what, what what are people what a lot of people probably don't know is that you do do a lot for the community. I mean, I've seen you around doing a number of events, and um, because of your high profile. You're able then to start the discussion about racism and inequality, and so I know that you you do a hell of a lot. So just give the audience an idea of the sort of things that you get behind. Yeah, I, I never like talk about these things, Wilfred. You know, it just feels strange. You know, I, you know, I'm the showman. You know, I just want to sing the songs. You know, what I'm saying when, when I go in and just leave the trail, and some other people talk about where they, they were. So no, I I I just look. I tell you one example. I was in. Um, I did um, Cokethorpe School in Oxford a few days ago, um, and and being in that school is is really the the reasons why I'm saying that I think the story that I that I have is the most important thing to me because it, it not only can inspire hopefully people from my own community, but it's also inspired the next generation of leaders that probably would never see my my community. And going to Cokethorpe Cork, School to do that talk last week was just amazing to see how people there know the story. They know the Lee virus. But when I look in the audience, no one looks like me. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's wonderful to know that through food and music, you know, our story, you know, is being told now. You know, as I said, you know, back then when I was a kid going to school, you would have never had, you know, somebody who was into, you know, cooking some food and doing these things, you know, being at the Ox doing the Oxford debate twice, you know, which which I've done the Oxford debate twice, which is to me is the even you know, when I think about that thing, Lord of mercy, is that really you? But you have something to say. And and I'm grateful that I have these platforms to be able to tell this story of the same thing that if I can do it, 
then you can do it. And it doesn't matter who you are. It still takes the same function to take you from where you are now into somebody who that you can say is a successful business person. Mm. Now, the, the the final bit of the conversation I want to have is that, you know, they're now making a movie about you. You're making a movie about you. I mean, it's like, that is just extraordinary. Tell me about that and how did that come about? Yeah, I, I'm still I'm still pinching myself. Well, for you know, because I'm, I'm, I love films. You know, I, I, there's nothing better I love more than curling up on the set with Christopher, my boy. My, I think you've met Christopher, my ten year old. Um, yeah, and and we watch films and 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 have a great time. But then to hear somebody says they're gonna make a movie about my own life is is that punch in the air moment. But not not when anybody else is there, because you can't do that moment when someone's around. Is that it's a pow moment on your own in the you know, I would say. Because it's it's inspirational to even my own self, you know, hovering above my own self as the young Levi Roots, as I do at times um, when I'm stressed and I remember where I am. I do hover above and I see the Levi Roots down there and say, boy, I wish somebody could have, like somebody from a Dragon's Den or somebody could have come pull you up in those moments. And to hear somebody say that move me is going to be made alive, where I can 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 tell that story. And be that story for that kid who, who Levi's in a movie and around the world is going to go to be able to, to tell it. I can pull you up, man. I can help you out here. Just listen to me. Here's my story. So it's, it's a phenomenal thing to, to be doing it. Um, I'm so, re- tell me, how, how did it come about? Um, how did it get? And where, and where, um, where, where, are we, where are you with it at the moment? I had written my life story um, ever since I was in prison. I came out with the book. It was called A Dreadlock Holiday, about my time, you know, going in and then coming out throughout the whole five years that I spent mismatch of diaries and story and stories that I'd written. Um, the, the, the source got in the way and we never got to do the movie, obviously, you know, but it is a great thing that happened because now with the source thing and the dragons, then it is a great ending to the movie and adds into the book, which wasn't there when I'd written it. When I came out, when I came out of prison, so it was about finding a, a producer that that loved the idea of that to be able to to bring it together. And I found a gentleman called Nick Moorcroft and his partner, his wife Meg Leonard, um, and they are two of the biggest producers in the country. They've done Finding Your Feet, the Centurions movie. They've just done Fisherman's Friend, which was one of the biggest movies um, across of the UK. And and that team over the past ten years has done some of the biggest movies in in this country. Um, so it was amazing that it's them that has the you know the tick box of big people that everyone knows. And you you say Nick Moorcroft and like Meg Leonard, everybody knows it. What you're talking about? They they came approach and said that they wanted to do it. And um, we 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 got uh, a writer Roy Williams because I wanted to have a real black writer to be able to tell the Levi Root story, even though it's produced by Nick and Meg, but I think it was necessary for us to have somebody who has been there. You know, like I said about inspiration, if you haven't been there, done it, then you can't tell it. So I, 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 we got Roy, Roy Williams in to, to, write, to, to write the script. Um, and now we, we've got the director on board. And last week I would just send the list of actors that, um, that they think of playing myself and my mom and Teresa. And 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 everybody else in in the movie. So it's just it's just it's just getting fantastic every week. Now I'm just getting more fantastic news that I'm just now looking at actors and, and things like that. Yeah. But, but, but Levi, look, I yeah. expect to have a cameo role in this film. You know, when you say yeah. Levi meets the black farmer, so yeah. you know, yeah. Some, yeah. somehow get that writer to write me in the script. Yeah. I, I love that. Be- I love that. <laughs> yeah. And so, when is it going to? When is it due to be going out? Yeah, well, you know, at these things, movies take a long time. You know, I, you know, I'm seeing where we are now by actors and maybe the press release in the next few weeks or so. Um, I think production will will start um, by the autumn, um, and we'll film in Jamaica um, for that opening scene of the whole coming over from the UK and all that kind of stuff, which was written in my in my original book. Um, mm-hmm. That scene is taken from from the book. Um, so yeah, we're filming Jamaica and then come back. So I, I see this as 2024, perhaps Christmas um, next year, um, which would be a, a fantastic 
I'm thinking for the movie. Or maybe spring the following year. Who knows? But as long as we start shooting, that's the key thing for me. Because that is the next stage. Because I've been going stages by stages and get excited every time we get the director, punch the ear. Now we'll get mm. the actors, I'm punching the ear. So next thing is, yeah. to, is to say when we start filming. I think it, it's fantastic. I mean, just talking to you now, it's, it's such an inspiring and, and story. And it just goes to show what human beings can do with you know with all the trials and tribulations that you have in your life but able to succeed i think is is phenomenal so just finishing off on the theme of this uh, this podcast is success is not normal so what is it that you think that you had to do in order to achieve the success that you now have don't undermine your worth by comparing yourself with others. It's because we are all different why each of us is special. So don't set your goals by what other people deem important. Because at the end of the day, only you can become the best of you. And that is special. That is special. That is a fantastic way of ending the podcast. Levi, as I said before, thank you very much. I feel really honoured that we had a chance to sort of chat. And um, I hope you like it uh, when it goes out. But um, Tom here is going to be um, editing it. We'll get it across. Um, hit it me good, won't you? Hit All it right. yeah, this, this, is, this is really good. This is very, very good. You have been listening to myself, Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, or better known as The Black Farmer. This was the Success is Not Normal podcast. Stay tuned for the next week's episode.